which means the next ones. And point it more towards the laptop, right? Just there was two things. To, okay, so here we go. Down. Oh, don't. Down. Oh. Okay. Go Maybe back. <laughs> I am just not going to go back. There we go. Okay. okay so just, just. Uh, just do that. Yeah, just do that. Okay. One. But wait, so I'm pointing it towards that, right? Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry. Technical difficulties. Hi. Welcome to the seed. If you haven't been here before, I have been here every year. I'm proud to say. I think it's a really fantastic conference. And I'm glad that they've moved all the speaking in one area, because maybe you can hear me this time. <laughs> so my name is Jenny Brown. I am, along with my husband, we're the founders of the Woodstock Farm Animal Sanctuary. Um, there's a couple of sanctuaries. Woo, what? Thank you. There are a couple of farm sanctuaries in New York State. Um, we are two hours north of the George Washington Bridge, and you can actually take the Adirondack Trailways to get to the sanctuary. So if you ever have an itching to not only hug a farm animal, learn more about veganism, but maybe you want to come up and scoop their poop, we can offer that to you. There's a lot. So, and our volunteers really get a lot out of coming up and spending time with the animals and um, just being around them as opposed to being on a tour. Um, because being around them, for someone who says you're against cruelty to animals, being around these animals makes it so obvious that they're just as thinking and feeling as our beloved cats and dogs. I'll start off by telling you that um, I don't speak a lot about the health reasons to be vegan, I don't speak a lot about the, um, the environmental reasons. I mean, you could do entire talks on those two reasons. But for me, it's about the ethical reasons to not consume our fellow animals. We forget oftentimes that we're animals too. And, um, and we live in a society where not only eating animals is so normalized, it's something that we don't think about. We don't look at our plate and look at the different items and think, whose breast milk was that in my mac and cheese? Because that's breast milk. Not just milk, you guys. We forget. We call them udders, but it's basically cow boobies. And that's breast milk. And, you know, whose flesh is that on my plate? You ask kids in this day and age, where does meat come from? and they'll say the freezer, 
or the cafeteria. And this is how far we've come and how bad it's gotten that we never think about who is on our plate. And for us, let me see if this actually works. Yeah, you've probably seen this slide like 10 times now. Um, for us, starting a sanctuary really allowed us the opportunity. To me, it's a fabulous form of activism. It allows the opportunity to be up close and personal with these animals that aren't really around us. It's easy to forget about the pigs and the chickens or we draw in our minds, we have bucolic images of these animals and cows grazing in the field and chickens happily clucking and pecking at the dirt and living the good life. We're all, you know, we read old MacDonald had a farm when we're in school and we're taught to count and to read with animals, farm animals. And yet, you know, kids go home and their parents basically deny them something that is so instilled in them, something that's so ingrained in them that they love animals. You know, there's that saying that you put a carrot in a crib with a baby and you put a rabbit in the crib with the baby and a true carnivore would, you know, eat the rabbit, skin, eyeballs, ears, intestines, the whole thing. That's a real carnivore. A carnivore is one who would see a squirrel and run after the squirrel with the lightning speed of a carnivore and salivate when we see roadkill or, um, you know, attack a squirrel, a living being, with a carnivorous-like speed and bite at them and eat them raw. That's a real carnivore. We cook our food. We don't like to see the head or any body parts that resemble an animal. So again, not only is eating meat so normalized in our society, the sad thing is, is it's celebrated. It is with the pig roast and it's with the signs, the t-shirts that says, bacon makes everything taste better and the bacon cupcakes and the bacon um, chocolate and everything, you know, not, I mean, merchandise, you can get a bacon Band-Aid. It's celebrated. And in what other aspects of our life do we look the other way when it comes to not truly living our own highest ideals, our own ethical standards, our values to be more compassionate people? So for me, I did some undercover work when, um, right out of college, I went to film school and I did some undercover work for PETA. Fast forward, I ended up working in film and television for over a decade, but the undercover work that I'd done for PETA in Premarin facilities, if you're not familiar with what that is, it's horses that are being kept impregnated so we can collect their urine, which is really high in estrogen. What I saw in that barn, you know, even though I'm from Kentucky, it wasn't like I was around horses all the time, but it's truly a new form of factory farming for a drug that millions of women take that's like an estrogen replacement drug when you're menopausal. So that was the start to doing some undercover work, and I had quite a few failed attempts, but then some successful ones, and it wasn't until I started receiving farm sanctuary literature and as somebody that had been a vegetarian from the time I was 18, I never stopped to think about the cows who produce milk only when they're impregnated and the chickens who live the most miserable lives of all. It's easy for us to not really, we want to say, well, these animals just produce these items, these products, but the truth of the matter is, it is, and this sounds a little extreme to say, but it's true, it is all the exploitation of female reproductive systems. And so girls, if you consider yourself a feminist, um, you need to take a look at how we exploit these animals' bodies on a daily basis. So, um, right on my sisters. <laughs> so, what's amazing is that people come to the sanctuary of course, this nice girl is already vegan, but um, 
to come and interact with these animals that are not tangible beings in our society. And when you're around the pigs and the chickens and the cows and our super sweet Devlin, the sheep, who's so cute when you like scratch his back or his butt, he air nibbles like this. It's very strange, it's very cute. Then we have super sweet star. And so we have a lot of goats. We focus specifically on food production animals. We had a mule for some time, but she actually went to live at Catskill Animal Sanctuary where they have blind horses because she became blind. But our focus is truly on the animals who we eat and wear. So goats, a lot of people don't realize that 70% of the world's population eats goats. We don't even think about it. But down here in New York City, there's almost 100 what they call live kill markets where they bring in small goats, they bring in lambs, they have calves. You might see a live poultry sign, but inside is like a little shop of horrors. And actually something that we're doing as part of our outreach and advocacy is that we've been taking part in vigils here around the city outside of slaughterhouses because many people who live in those neighborhoods don't even realize that it's a slaughterhouse. It's a storefront slaughterhouse and they're all over the city catering to, you know, those who consume halal meat, meat that has to be slaughtered, animals that have to be slaughtered a certain way. And also South Americans, Middle East, there's a lot of goat consumption. So we've got some cuties. Um, you know, everybody should kiss a pig. But this is, this is what is so staggering and mind-boggling, that in terms of the animals that we interact with, we could also say kill, in terms of the animals we interact with in this country, only 2% are the fur animals, the animals who are hunted, the animals who linger in laboratories, and even the cats and dogs at animal shelters, those animals make up 2% of the animals in this country who are living, who are dying at our hands. But it's 98% of them that we, who we never see and who, you know, gone is the, the local farms where we might drive down the road and see some happy quasi-happy pigs or chickens or cows, unless you're out in California, unless you're in certain states where I think it's a total of 10% of dairy cows, 15% of dairy cows actually can roam out in fields and eat pastures. The rest of them are on what's known as dry lots, and I'll show you some pictures of that. But these animals largely exist behind closed doors in fortresses that lack even the most basic transparency. And this is wrong. This is corrupt. We have a broken food system where out of sight, out of mind is the status quo. And when you really think about it, and I always like to make this comparison, the way we treat animals is like a science fiction horror film where we put all these animals in a factory, we never see them, we confine them, we mutilate them, tail docking, teeth pulling, castration, all without antibiotics or, I mean, excuse me, all without anesthesia or painkillers, things that we, if we did to our cats and dogs, would land you in jail. So it's a very schizophrenic relationship we have with the animals whom we share this country and this earth with. And for all those reasons, you know, even if you say, ah, they're farm animals, ah, I don't care if chickens are boiled alive, they're just chickens. First of all, we know personally that chickens have amazing personalities. So many calls and interactions and vocal variations to one another, it's pretty amazing. But it's clear to see also the lack of sustainability in feeding the crops to the animals who burn off most of that energy metabolically instead of eating the grains ourselves. 
it's 15 pounds of grain to produce a single pound of meat. And so when we talk about world hunger, and for those vegans here in the room, and I don't know, and I don't even want to do a show of hands, I want to speak to all you guys, but, you know, for those of us who profess to care about the environment, you know, it's a pretty tricky compromise when we don't eliminate animal products from our diet for that reason alone. This is, you may fly and be at a lower altitude and see something like this and not have any idea that there might be tens of thousands of chickens in there. This one is specifically a pig farm. Those animals never see the light of day. The females are all kept in gestation crates. And this, environmentally, this is a manure lagoon. And when we have storms and, and you know, heavy rain, that water leaches into our drinking water and we've done a whole lot to damage our waterways. Here's another factory farm. What does that remind you of? Kind of reminds you of a concentration camp. And some people really get their knickers in a twist when you talk about the comparison between concentration camps, Auschwitz, and what we're doing to these animals. But I have to tell you, and this is hard to hear, and you might think it's controversial, but it's even worse. It's even worse than how those people live. And yet, people don't like to make the comparisons because we societally want to think of these animals as lesser when they're not. And that's only in our mind and our cultural indoctrination. This what we like to say at the sanctuary, when you look at animal agriculture across the board and you look at the animals who suffer the worst, egg-laying hens suffer worse than any other animal. This took me a long time, became vegetarian at, eight, at 18, ate cheese and eggs. Oh my God, I had an egg sandwich like every day of my life. Never really, maybe I knew something lurked out there that I kind of didn't want to look at, but I knew eventually that I had to look at it. And it was after I had done some undercover work for Farm Sanctuary in 2002, where I was sent undercover. You know, stockyards and auctions are actually open to the public. I fashioned up a little purse that had a little hole with a little camera. And the whole point of that mission was to document downed animals. And those are those animals, first of all, who suffer unimaginable, unimaginable atrocities. Because in order to be sold for meat, those animals have to be alive when they reach the slaughterhouse. So even if their legs are broken, their hips are broken, they're suffering from cancer, dehydration, they can't get up, they are chained and dragged. They have high pressure water hoses inserted into their vaginas or their anus or their nostrils. They're bulldozed, they're chained. And you can actually, as they're being dragged onto the trucks, and I know this is hard to hear you guys, you can hear their bones breaking. But as long as they make it to the slaughterhouse alive, there's profit to be made. And what I saw in that one week was what led me to stop my get out of film and television. I didn't care about it anymore and producing stuff for Discovery Channel where they blanket everything with techno music and we've lost our way also with educational programming. But what I saw that week changed my life. And this is my purpose, but this isn't about me. These are about these animals and the nine billion chickens, egg layers, and the chickens who we call, and industry calls broilers, those who are raised for meat. And just so you know, it's not the same chickens. We have totally genetically manipulated these poor animals. These little, they're called battery cage hens or commercial layers, and they are the ones who live in battery cages, who can't spread their wings, 
who can't peck at the ground, who don't have any privacy to go lay their eggs, which they all want to do in nesting material, everything that makes life worth living to these poor hens who are laying eggs is denied them. And they de-beak them at the hatcheries because they're so stressed out, they're so crammed in together. It's literally six to seven hens to a cage the size of a file cabinet drawer, or for those of us who grew up with albums, think of an album cover, basically about the same size. We have lost our way. When you think about how these animals, these sentient, emotional, thinking, feeling, emotional animals that we're capable of doing this is shocking. But let me tell you, there's no difference also with free range and humane and cage free when it comes to the hatcheries. So know that no chicken in this day and age ever meets their mother. They never ever meet their mother. And if you've seen a chicken with a chick, you know that there is such an incredible bond and they learn so much from their mothers. All these chickens, whether they're the meat type birds or the egg laying type birds, all come from massive hatcheries. And when it comes to the birds who are used specifically for egg laying, the males are of no economic value at all because they are not the chickens who are genetically manipulated specifically for massive breasts, for chicken breasts that people, God forbid you get a salad this day and age without having a freaking chicken breast on your salad, okay? Or some other type of animal. I'm so over that, right? Okay, I'm gonna get back, get off my soapbox. <laughs> but for those birds who are the meat birds, believe it or not, their lives are better because at the hatcheries, for these egg-laying birds, all the males, they are sexed as soon as they are hatched and they're dumped on conveyor belts, just like widgets on a factory line. And every chick is quickly picked up, they spread their legs, they press on what's known as their vent, AKA their everything hole. They poop and they reproduce out of there. And anyway, if you see a male organ, those chicks are immediately discarded. They're either ground up alive with what's known as a macerator and they become fertilizer, um, or animal byproducts that are fed back to animals, sometimes even these chickens. All the males, 280 million males a year, are discarded by the egg industry. And it isn't just, and these are how the hens live, this is a closer view. And mind you, and this is something I like to make sure people know, because if I can't get you, when it comes to having compassion for these animals, let me gross you out, okay? The egg comes from the same orifice they poop from, they reproduce from. And by the way, ladies, we shed our eggs once a month, you know? Well, they're shedding them all the time. So make no mistake about it, you are scrambling up some chicken, period, when you eat eggs, okay? Let me gross you out with that, okay? Take a look at what it really is. It's kind of disgusting. Just putting that out there. These are girls at our sanctuary who had lived two years in that particular kind of misery. And there was a major egg laying rescue. Some of these farms, if they don't have a processing operation close to them, meaning a slaughterhouse, who's gonna accept these little tiny skinny birds because they're only four pounds. There's hardly any meat on their bodies. They're typically at two years old, even though chickens, natural chickens, could live to be 10 or 12 years old. But at two years old, this particular egg farm was gonna gas all the hens. If they don't send them to slaughter, they gas the whole buildings, and then they bury them and replace them with younger, more productive egg-laying hens. So these girls are living the good life. And I have to say, there is nothing, nothing for those of us who are fighting this fight for farm animals. There is nothing like seeing one of these sweet girls leaving the cage, 
spreading her wings for the first time and taking her first steps of liberty. It's literally like they're walking on the moon because they've never been able to stretch their legs. And now they dust bathe and they hang out and they get as much food as they want to eat. They've got perches where they sleep at night. All chickens want to be on a perch. It's a natural thing to sort of protect them from any potential predators in the wild. And they all have nest boxes. So when they do lay their chicken periods, they can do it in private like they would like to. <laughs> this is all the male chicks. If they're not ground up alive, they're collected in, they go down a chute, and instead of a macerator, they're collected in giant plastic bags, and they're discarded alive out in dumpsters. This is every brother of every hen who's laying eggs. Whether or not you say, but I get my eggs from Joe Farmer up the road. I see his chickens outside. They're happy. He takes good care of them. They're still... He got those chickens from a hatchery. He doesn't want the male versions of these chickens. They don't lay eggs. They don't gain enough weight to be used for meat economically. So he's purchasing hens, sexed chicks, the female chicks, from hatcheries. And um, so he's contributing to that. And no farmer also is going to let his hens who aren't laying productively just hang out like a retirement home for egg-laying chickens. That doesn't happen. These are the birds who are raised for meat. These guys at the hatcheries also never meet their parents, but they're not de-beaked. The males are not ground up alive or suffocated, and they live on the floors of these massive industrial sheds in their own poop, eating quasi-limited quantities, but enough to get them to grow as quickly as possible. And these are the birds who reach market weight at 45 days of age. They are still peeping when they're shackled up and slaughtered at the slaughterhouse. But you look at the life of the meat birds versus the egg-laying birds, and I got to tell you, if I was to be reincarnated as a chicken, I would much rather be reincarnated as a chicken who's going to be used for meat, as opposed to living in a battery cage with all my brothers ground up alive or suffocated. There is truly more suffering in every egg you consume versus chicken breast. God, I'm long-winded. These are how pigs live. These are the female pigs who are used um, to impregnate over and over again, gestation crates. So let me tell you, pigs are the fourth smartest animals on earth. It's primates, dolphins, elephants, and pigs. Pigs have more advanced cognitive skills than three-year-old children. They're definitely more intelligent than dogs. But we somehow divide them between standards for those we love and standards for whom we eat. And this, these are how these pigs live day in and day out in crates that are barely bigger than the size of their body. Their gestation period is four months. The only time they leave these gestation crates is when they're marched down a hall to the next building where they have um, what's known as farrowing crates, which I don't think I have a picture, but farrowing crates are basically the exact same thing, but there's room on the sides for piglets to nurse from their mama. And they even have these bars to hold the mothers down so she can't get up. So she's pressed against the ground. Her babies are nursing. There's no nurturing, though. She has no access to her babies. And you see the babies wanting so badly to be with their mothers that they find ways to, like, if their face is sticking out, they'll be laying across their face. They want so desperately 
to be with their mothers. This image gives me nightmares. I have nightmares over this image. These are, it says the same thing at one production operation. These are all female pigs who are marked like industry products, never to leave these cages, only to go to another cage and be marched right back again. And yet, hipsters have their everything makes, bacon makes everything better. It's just the saddest comment on our cultural collective knowledge and compassion for these animals. And we know, we know that they're just as sensitive, they're highly intelligent. Not that we should base our compassion on intelligence either, but for those who maybe that, that matters in some way, know that you should eat your dog. You should actually eat your dog if you're gonna go by that standard. This is how all the babies live. They're separated. They live, even though their noses are like their hands, it's how they feel out the world. These guys are in slotted, slatted concrete floors, crammed into these cages, and all pigs are slaughtered at six months of age or when they reach 250 pounds. And they know what's coming. They can smell the fear. They know that that pig, they know that something terrifying is coming. They can see it, they, um, they anticipate it, and they are known for being able to do such things because of their intelligence. We are a country that shakes, this says, how could they be so cruel in Asia? And I accidentally cut this off and it says, here in America, we would never do such a thing. People are so horrified. We shake our fists at those Asian countries and they're so cruel and heartless that they could consume dogs. Can you believe that, dogs and cats? We have really put those blinders on tight when we can't make the connection that we are doing the same thing on a scale that far exceeds what they're doing. So, back to but I only consume happy meats. I go to Whole Foods and I get my meats and I feel a lot better because of that. I feel so much better. Those animals lived a good life, right? The chickens all still come from those hatcheries. By the way, we mail order living beings, little tiny babies. They have to be shipped out in the first 72 hours when supposedly they still have their they got nutrients from being in the egg. So 72 hours. I worked at UPS when I was 18, when I first started college, and they would open up these containers off the airplanes, and I can't tell you how many times I would see this and chicks that were spilled out and crushed in these airplane containers. This is also cage-free. That's cage-free. And free range, imagine the exact same thing, but there's maybe a door the size of a cat door over here. And there's maybe an area half the size of this stage. And if they open that door for five minutes and allow access to the outdoors, they can have the label free range slapped on it. And by the way, there's no governing bodies that are really inspecting these places. There was a huge scam that just happened in Australia. Over two million uh, hens were labeled, their eggs were labeled cage-free and free-range in Australia. And somehow, I don't know who caused the spoiler alert, but it was a huge lie. And this is part of the problem because it's not governed and regulated. All the males, still all thrown away, ground up alive. These are where your brown eggs come from. They come from the red hens. And so many people think, oh, I'm gonna buy brown eggs because they're more natural. They're still factory farmed. All the females are de-beaked. In these environments, they're still stressed to the max. And they're, 
and they're, um, they're all slaughtered at two years of age. Here's another cage-free operation. That's not the picture you probably imagined, another. This is an organic dairy farm. 85% of dairy cows live on what's known as dry lots, where they basically go outside, eat a bunch of grain and what's known as hay silage, it's just like powdered grass, and then they're marched right back inside where they're hooked up to machines, to their boobs, to their cow breasts. We can call them udders and whatever we want to to try to disconnect ourselves. But ladies, that's their breasts. That's the organic dairy operation. That looks really similar to a factory farm. Organic is the only label that is actually governed. But organic has nothing to do with animal welfare. It only means that they're not given antibiotics prophylactically, meaning they put it in their feed to keep them from getting sick and to promote growth and the feed that they're eating supposedly was grown without pesticides. It has nothing, let me say it again, organic has absolutely nothing to do with animal welfare. These mothers, again, just like I talked about the chickens, there are breeds that are used specifically for egg laying and there's breeds that are used specifically for their breast meat. They're too young to even be um, laying eggs yet, but for the dairy cows, from the time the females are 13 months old, they are artificially inseminated, sometimes 16 months, they're artificially inseminated, and they carry their babies for, for nine months. And when that baby is born, whether male or female, she was pulled away from her mother at birth, we think about the veal calves, but the females are also taken from their mothers at birth. They live in individualized huts, and um, year after year, they have a calf torn away from her pleas of protests, her heartbreaking bellows for her child. And they all become hamburger meat at about four to five years of age, even though cows could live for 20 to 25 years, we have forced her to produce far more milk in her short life by constant impregnation and antibiotics and growth hormones. That's why little nine-year-old girls in this country are starting their periods and have big breasts because of the growth hormones in the dairy products. Doesn't look much worse than veal. Their mothers live the same way. So many people will come to the sanctuary and say, I haven't eaten veal in 20 years. I can't believe what they do to those babies. I could never eat veal. But veal wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the dairy industry. Because, again, like the chickens, there are beef breeds and there are dairy breeds. And just like the chickens, it is the dairy breeds who suffer more so than the beef breeds. So every time we're drinking a glass of milk, we are directly supporting the veal industry. We're supporting the miserable lives of dairy cows and eventually hamburger meat, no matter what, no matter if it's organic and you see cows out grazing in a field, which again is a tiny fraction of the dairy cows out there, all the males are a direct byproduct. And sometimes the females too. This is one of the females. She's living, she gets like maybe three feet to walk forward and three to five feet to walk back in her little hut. They long for their mothers. They cry for their mothers. When I did undercover work, I walked by a pen of veal calves and they desperately suckled at my fingers. And it's, it's horrible. As far as the eye can see, 
This is how the females live until they're a little bit older, and then they're known as heifers. They haven't had a baby yet. Then they're all put together, and they eventually replace their mothers on the production line. You might have seen this series of photos from Joanne MacArthur, who did, has the book We Animals, and there's a film called Ghosts in Our Machine. This is an actual sequence of a mama cow having just given birth to a little female calf. But just like with the males, maybe right after the babies have had the first milk, the colostrum, which is really important for their health, they're taken away from their mothers. Some factory worker comes along. They're so weak, just born, always taken away within the first day or two of life. And they're carted off to never see her again. And they go to live in these pens isolated and alone so that we can do, continue the bizarre practice of drinking the breast milk of another species. Oh, I couldn't live without cheese. I just couldn't live without cheese. Well, cheese and dairy products have a natural occurring hormone that keeps those little calves coming back so they can eventually weigh like 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. It's called um, casomorphins, and it's like a natural occurring type of morphine. It's addictive. So these little babies, basically, they drink something that is like the leftover milk, the soy milk, different antibiotics, growth hormones. These are the beef cows. And as I was saying, beef cows, believe it or not, have it better than the dairy cows until they're about 10 months old. They've been out grazing with their mothers. They were born to their mothers, out in the pasture potentially. And once they're about 10 months old, they're all herded up by ranchers. They put them in chutes. They cut off their horns. They brand them and cause third degree burns on their faces or on their butts. They're castrated without anesthesia or painkillers. And then they go to part of a feedlot where they're converted from eating grass to grain, which basically starts shutting down their systems, but they're slaughtered before they can get too sick. And they're all getting antibiotics in their feed. This is what it looks like. That's a feedlot. That's where beef comes from. Foie gras, I don't really have time to get into it, but the force feeding of ducks, just so you know, here in New York State, the only foie gras operation still in this country is basically an hour away from here. Hudson Valley duck, Hudson Valley foie gras, all still relies on the force feeding of animals. And do you know that down has become a byproduct of the foie gras industry, it's leading the way. The reason you go into a pet store now and you see so much duck in the cans, it's a byproduct because we want our down jackets, our down comforters, our down pillows, and we don't realize they're not walking around a happy, you know, a park and picking up the little feathers. 30% of down that's on the market comes from geese and ducks who were live plucked. That would be like somebody ripping out all of our hair. They rip out under their wings and along their backside.
people find something within them that they didn't even know was missing. But during that time, we're helping millions of other animals just like them who are living and dying in these factory farms and on small farms alike. There is no humane alternative. What is humane about slashing the throat of a six-month-old calf who was taken away from their mother, but who might be considered humanely raised? What is humane about taking the life of an animal for the taste? And I'm not saying we're you know, angry at the Inuits and people who have no other way to eat other than consuming animals. We have a choice, you guys, and we can choose compassion over cruelty, compassion over killing. We have that choice. The most powerful, empowering choice that we can make to really, truly live our values of compassion. If you say you're against cruelty to animals, you cannot support these industries. And it's not as hard as you think, you guys. I'm 80 and I look this good because I'm vegan, right? I'm just saying, I'm just saying. So please, guys, think critically. Look at it. One of my favorite quotes that I always quote all the time was from a wonderful actress and animal advocate, Gretchen Weiler, and she said, we must not refuse to see with our eyes what they must endure with their bodies. Please look. If you have not really gone on a path to where you're eliminating dairy and meat and fish, you guys, we call them seafood. They're sea animals. They also feel pain. They have a central nervous system. And we're raping the oceans and destroying precious environments. So please, you guys, be conscious. Be a voice for animals. Know the facts. Learn the facts. Look at these images, because you know what? Every time I watch one of those films and bawl my eyes out, it just instills more passion in me to be a voice for these animals and to do what I can to make this the next social justice movement of our times as it needs to be. 55 billion animals in this country die. Not in this country, in the world, and 10 billion animals in this country when we have a choice. Please, pick up a vegan cookbook, go online, see what it's about, and as Gandhi said, be the change we wish to see in the world. Thanks, guys. Teary. <laughs> I only have five minutes because of my verbal diarrhea. I only have five minutes to answer questions. Would anybody like to ask a question? Yes, ma'am. She's asking if I ever give a talk like this to mainstream meat-eating people. It's less about empowering people to go out and do something.